Delibird, the Delivery Pokémon, versus Spinda, the Spot Panda Pokémon. This matchup was requested a while ago, but I just had to wait until the end of the year for this one. This matchup describes holiday gatherings with my family all too well. Welcome everyone, I'm Exceptional, and I hope you are too. Today, in the last video of 2023, we will be seeing which of these two Pokémon can defeat Pokémon Fire Red, including the Round 2 Elite Four, the fastest. Challenge rules are in the description. Both sharing the fast growth rate should make these runs slightly more palatable to my sanity. Plus, in my versus challenges, I allow myself a single egg move with each. That at least allows Delibird to have something other than present before Mount Moon. We have a lot to cover, so as always, let's roll a die to see who goes first. 1 to 10 for Delibird, 11 to 20 for Spinda. That's a 3. Delibird, I choose you! As we can see, Delibird's learn set leaves a little something to be desired. Through level up we get one move, Delibird's signature move present. It has a chance to do a few different things. 40% for a base 40 power attack, 30% for base 80, and 10% for base 120. That leaves the last 20% a 1 in 5 chance of healing our target for a quarter of their max HP. For a little bit of fun, I'm gonna try and keep it on our move set for as long as I can. My nickname scheme for this one is definitely geared towards the holiday season with family. I choose Peppermint for Delibird, which will pair nicely with Spinda's. Together, they then pair nicely with some hot chocolate as you watch Nerf darts fly by your face. As I mentioned in the intro, I grant each of our racers a single egg move. Out of Delibird's options, I saw Aurora Beam being the best. Against Charmander in the lab though, I was feeling festive, defeating him with Present alone. Aurora Beam gives us a super effective option that also benefits from Stab or same type attack bonus. After a month of playing a ton of legendaries, I decided to make a beeline straight to Brock without any further consideration. Before checking out how that went, I'd like to keep my runners mostly even, so let's jump back to see Spinda's path to Brock. Spinda is going to play quite differently in the early game. As a normal type, we have no great options to start with against Brock. For egg moves, I hummed and hawed about this for a good few minutes before deciding to go with Rock Slide. It'll give us a bit more damage output against early opponents like the rival's Pidgeotto, and Rock tends to do quite well offensively in Fire Red. I'd almost call it the water type of physical stats if it weren't for all those defensive weaknesses. For Spinda's nickname, it has to be Schnapps. Tis the season. For our nature, I've gone with Rash, increasing special attack while decreasing special defense. Regular viewers of the channel know that I'm already salivating slightly over TM4 later in the game, and I felt like our special defense was much less threatened. This keeps our attack stat neutral because although the late game plan is special, having the option of stab return later would be fantastic. Spinda will not be making a dash to Brock. I don't see us having any success against him until level 12 when we learn Faint Attack, so I choose to defeat every trainer on the way through Viridian Forest. Alright, let's jump back to Peppermint and check out those Brock fails. I, I mean battles. <laughs> having Stab Aurora Beam is fantastic here. Even at only level 6, we can two-shot Geodude without taking any damage, leveling all the way up to 8. That's where the good news ends though. Onyx's Stab, four times super effective Rock Tomb against our super frail defenses makes for some crushed Peppermint. I defeat Camper Liam, leveling up to 9 before starting the battle, and try again. It's the same story with Geodude, and unfortunately Onyx as well. At 21 speed, we're 4 short of outspeeding Onyx getting taken down. I went back into the forest, doing a little bit of additional grinding, leveling up to 13, and trying again. It seems that I was a little bit tired though, not noticing that I was flat out of power points. Well, this isn't happening with present. Okay, this time with healthier PP, Geodude falls and let's see how Onyx goes. We actually almost have the damage to one-shot him and thankfully he misses Rock Tomb. If he's using it, we're in one-shot range. We win the battle on the next turn. Let's see how Schnapps handled Brock. Okay, so because I can't help myself, I decided for whatever reason that I needed to face Brock before level 12. Let's see how that goes. Not well. Schnapps manages to bring Geodude to just under two-thirds health while getting completely picked apart. Yep, could have seen that one coming. 
I do a bit of grinding in the grass, leveling up to 12, and learning Faint Attack. This time, things go much smoother, going from hitting with a move that Brock's Pokémon resists to a neutral special move targeting his weaker special defense. We can now bring down Geodude in 3, and Onix in 4. Sweet! This fast growth rate is sure nice to play with for a change, let's keep moving. Along the next route, I'll note that with both Pokémon, I am being forced to play reasonably conservatively. These early Rattatas on the Rocket Grunts have Stab Hyper Fang, which hurts a whole lot. But our coverage expands, leveling up to 16 and learning Psy Beam. Psychic is a fantastic typing in Fire Red as the region is littered with poison types. On the other side of the cave, I make sure to grab the Dome Fossil. You can actually watch my mental process in real time as we leave the cave here. I run back and forth super quickly as I can't decide if I want to teach Mega Punch or Mega Kick. I decide against it, proceeding to Cerulean City next. Misty Starmy hurts, and we do have a minus special defense nature, so I face Rival 2 first. Rock Slide does great damage against Pidgeotto, but unfortunately we get tagged by a sand attack. Honestly, this is only mildly annoying today as I bring down Bird Brains with Faint Attack. Faint Attack cannot miss, take that, you! Rattata hurts a whole lot as we bring him down with more faint attacks, but our damage output is definitely lacking against Squirtle. We end up being brought down. In the next battle, we see something even better. Rock Slide triggers its 30% chance to flinch, so our accuracy is intact as we bring down Pidgeotto. Then Rattata doesn't get a critical hit this time, so we're in much better shape against Squirtle. Psy Beam does slightly more damage, but that crit that we got sealed the deal. The difference between good and bad luck, eh? We clean up Abra and move on down Nugget Bridge. On Route 25, I make sure to pull down Camper Flint to gain access to TM43 Secret Power. This 70 base power normal move, along with Stab, becomes 105, plus boasts a 30% chance for a secondary effect. Most of the time, that's going to be Paralysis. Schnapsis' next stop is Misty, so let's catch up with Peppermint. Back in Mount Moon, I make sure to grab the Helix Fossil. I just can't do it, not in this video. I have to show equal love to all of my supporters, just like how each of you have supported me over the year. Thank you so much. Outside of the cave, I'm actually going to teach both Mega Punch and Mega Kick. We have the open move slots right now, so we might as well, right? Peppermint is going to face Rival 2 as well. Aurora Beam allows us to almost delete Pidgeotto in a single shot. It's the holiday season though, here buddy, have a present. And I've now missed and taken a sand attack for no reason. This is actually worse than it looks because of our ability, Hustle. It increases our physical attacks by 50% at the cost of 20% accuracy. None of our physical moves have 100% accuracy to begin with, and we can't connect with Charmander being brought down. It doesn't really get better either, so after a few wipes, I decide to head to the gym to take on Misty instead. Let's jump in. Well, as it turns out, having hustle and low accuracy moves is incredibly risky. Water Pulse hurts a whole bunch, and we're brought down by Misty's lead Staryu after landing only a single shot. Um, sorry Peppermint, why don't you get yourself together while we go check out Schnapps? Schnapps is very much sitting on better offensive options, and having defeated Rival 2 and helped Bill already is a much higher level. Two Psy Beams bring down Staryu, but we're almost down to half health already. Super Effective Faint Attack looks to be doing right around half to Starmie, but we don't have nearly enough hit points to survive Starmie's onslaught being brought down again. I reset a couple of times, but once Staryu finally decided to go for Harden instead of Water Pulse, we face Starmie at full health. This time, we have the hit points to stand up to two Water Pulses, bringing down Starmie with two Faint Attacks. Well, I guess that wasn't too bad. Let's see if Peppermint is doing any better. Well, not really yet. I ended up defeating the trainers in her gym, leveling up to 20 and trying Rival 2 again. Level 20 gives us the one-shot against Pidgeotto as we've now leveled over a damage rounding threshold. Mega Kick then connects with Charmander for another one-shot, and we're in good shape for the rest of the battle. I continue along the next route, helping Bill, and after how badly we got our butt kicked by Misty, I actually choose to head south to Vermilion City instead. I feel like I should have at least tried it, but these first playthroughs are all about taking chances, making mistakes, and getting messy! 
On the lower deck of the SSN, I make sure to grab TM44 Rest. I don't think that the frail Deli Bird will find much use for it, but hey, I foresee a high level finish and you never know what's going to be useful. Then it's time for another rival battle. It actually goes identically to Rival 2 with Aurora Beam and Mega Kick eliminating his biggest threats in a single shot. I have a plan that involves Hustle later, but for now this high risk, high reward, Mega Kicking Hustle I've got going on seems to be working pretty darn well. Misty is our only progression option right now, coming back to battle her with some additional levels. Mega Punch makes Staryu go away in a single shot, leveling up to 28 over another damage rounding threshold. Mega Kick hits the second time, bringing Starmie way down to red bar. Uh oh, uh, here, have a present buddy. Hey, that wasn't too bad. I go for Mega Punch, managing to win the speed tie this round and drop Starmie. <laughs> yes, I am constantly mixing in present right now for fun. I'll worry about the completion time in the second playthroughs. I choose to head east towards Rock Tunnel next. Lieutenant Surge scares me. On Route 9 lies TM-40 Aerial Ace. This 60 base power flying move becomes 90 power including stab. Then we add on Hustle for another 50% increase, but Aerial Ace cannot miss, so the accuracy doesn't matter. I teach it immediately, then in Rock Tunnel I make another update. Misty gave us TM3 Water Pulse for defeating her. I taught Secret Power over Mega Kick, but honestly I didn't use it much. Water Pulse replaces that and we're ready to rock again. I then quickly progress through the typical mid-game chores, defeating the rockets and heading to Erika's gym next. I'm making sure to grab the coin case as well. I plan on coming back here for TM13 Ice Beam from the game corner later, but we're a ways off from affording that. Peppermint has been feeling strong again, prepping for a third badge, so let's hop back to Schnapps. Schnapps is definitely following a more conventional route. I'm making sure to grab any items that I might find useful, including the citrus berry and rare candy at the top of Route 6. Schnapps is then ready to face Rival 3 next. I haven't bothered teaching Secret Power, and during the battle we leveled to 27, learning Dizzy Punch. It's arguably worse than Secret Power, but much more in fitting with Schnapps' whole theme here, so I chose it in this first run. The rival doesn't prove much of a challenge, targeting Lieutenant Surge next. I have a Cherry Berry equipped for safety, and this is one of those battles that I wanted to keep my attack stat higher for. Stab Dizzy Punch does a lot of damage to his team, but maybe not enough to justify repeating this next run. Water Pulse, after all, would be a two-shot as well without the risk of static. Schnapps has no problem defeating Surge, so let's head into the mid-game. It's business as usual, following the exact same route as Peppermint, but in Erica's gym, it seems that I've strept schnapps a little bit thin. I was out of healing items, and after getting paralyzed by this execute that I did not mean to battle, we're looking pretty rough. I don't take a reset, but I need to leave and heal quickly. Instead of heading straight back to the gym though, I'm going to detour to Saffron City. I'll do a touch of shopping, then heading to the south end of town to pick up TM29 Psychic from Mr. Psychic. This is going to be a nice power upgrade over Psybeam, and I'm thinking that we're going to need it against Erica. Let's see if I'm right. Remember how I said earlier that I'm really stubborn sometimes? Well, even though I had Psychic in my bags, I decided not to use it, sticking to my original plan of facing Erica without it. Ah, I can be a real egghead sometimes. I have a Cherry Berry saving us from Victory Bell Stun Sproar, and from there, it's a pretty straightforward battle. Let's face it though, next run, I'll be doing this with Psychic. That's now four badges for Schnapps. Peppermint had a really hard decision to make in this battle. Do I defeat them all with stab super effective ice moves, or stab super effective flying moves? Victory Bell's special defense is slightly lower, while Tangela's is much lower, defeating both of them with Aurora Beam. Vile Plume's defense is slightly lower, switching to Aerial Ace for her. Heh, these runs had their frustrations, but I was having a ton of fun while playing them. Erica falls, so let's grab that fourth badge from Surge quick. I was scared about Lieutenant Surge because of our frail defense and weakness to the electric type. Aurora Beam takes out Voltorb and Pikachu easily enough, but let me point out that because of our fast growth rate, we're already at level 38. My fears about this battle are confirmed, as even 14 levels higher, Raichu's Shockwave hits for just over half damage. We hit through our paralysis, thankfully ending the battle, but wowza. I don't see Peppermint doing this on the first pass next run. With our competitors on even ground again, let's take a quick look at how things are lining up. 
Surprisingly, Schnapps took an early lead against Brock and has maintained that lead through the first four badges. Peppermint is gaining a lot of momentum, and now with our fantastic coverage, Schnapps better look out as Peppermint keeps gaining time back. The next leg of our adventure brings us to Pokemon Tower, where we face Rival 4 next. Speaking of that great coverage, we have a super effective answer against every one of his first three Pokemon, taking each out in a single shot. Kadabra falls to our hustle-boosted Aerial Ace, with Gyarados falling to two more Aurora Beams. Things are feeling pretty good, but we're about to cross a threshold in the game where we start seeing much more powerful opponents. Our next stop in Silphco holds exactly those. Both runners will be doing a full item collection in Silphco. I want to try and dial in our vitamins as best as I can, and Peppermint will be wanting a treat from the game corner. I have to keep my wits about me though in this area, making sure to save any time I'm about to encounter a trainer that has the potential to mess me up. We are running a deli bird after all. After collecting all of the items, it's time to face Rival 5 and our first encounter with third stage Pokemon. Since we're now facing a fully grown bird brains, for the first time since Rival 2, we don't one-shot his lead. We still bring down Pidgeot on the next turn easily enough, but that's the end of the good news again. At 92 speed, we're actually speed tied with this Charizard, but he gets the better of us this time, ending the battle with Stab's super effective flamethrower. While playing, I wasn't aware of that speed tie, seeing a hopeless battle and deciding to just move on. Even so, I don't think we're capable of one-shotting that Charizard at the moment. I head to Celadon instead, visiting the department store to invest in those vitamins. It's important to try to do this as early as possible, as the vitamins cap out at 100 EVs, while the EV max is actually 255. It's best to put these points in the stats you want early to grab the most benefits from any EVs you collect in the next sections. For Peppermint, I focus on special attack first, and then attack, as I see being a mixed attacker remaining very valuable. I cruise down Cycling Road, avoiding as many trainers as possible for now. Don't worry, like I mentioned, these Pokémon are not the strongest. We'll be back for some grinding once we need it. While Peppermint goes to complete the Safari Zone and prep for Koga, we'll jump back and catch up with Schnapps again. Schnapps is ready to face Rival 4 back in Pokémon Tower, and clearly with this movement, I had put the controller in his hands. I was just praising how good Peppermint's coverage was, and Schnapps is no different. Psychic, Water, and Dark with Stab, Dizzy Punch for backup is quite the combo. I one-shot his entire team, knowing I won't against Wartortle. So I switch to Dizzy Punch for the confusion, getting it, but he hits through. We end the battle on the next turn, heading for Sylph next. It's gonna be an identical route to Peppermint, so I'm gonna jump us ahead right to Rival 5. Schnapps is gonna have a much better time in this battle, but that's not to say a good one. Our encounter against Pidgeot is rough. I continue going for Dizzy Punch, assuming that it's doing more damage. Pidgeot then hits a Feather Dance, dropping our attack by two stages, so I switch to Faint Attack, and it seems that my assumption was correct. Pidgeot falls, but we're pretty beat up already. Schnapps does very well despite this, making it all the way to Blastoise in the back. But that's a foe that with only 23 health remaining and an incoming future sight, we stood no chance against. So it's Schnapps's turn to be heading down Cycling Road after stopping to buy vitamins. I felt the answer was more obvious for Schnapps, given that I intend to lean into Calm Mind and our impressive special coverage for the late game. I maxed our special attack first with Calciums, finishing with Carbos for speed. Delicious. Nothing of note happens in between, with our sights set on Koga next. I know that the reason I haven't taught Psychic to Schnapps yet is because I wanted to keep the higher PP of Psybeam. While editing this, I keep thinking about how there are plenty of quick, free heals along my path after being able to learn Psychic that I would likely have no problems managing the lower power points with. Psybeam does end up working just fine here, defeating Koga on the first attempt, but again, I feel like Psychic would have been the safer play. Schnapps was a question of optimization, but with poor Peppermint... Aurora Beam misses the one-shot against Coughing's lead Koga, and it blows up, immediately ending the battle. Okay, going training! Back at level 48 over the next damage rounding threshold, we're doing quite a bit better. Taking out Coughing in one makes a big difference, and so does figuring out that Aerial Ace is a two-shot once I switch to it. Unfortunately, that knowledge cost me some damage against his muck, and his Ace Wheezing ends the battle. 
What? This isn't Koga. That's because we're off training again. Currently, we're in the Fighting Dojo. You may notice the five additional resets. Turns out that if Muck goes for Acid Armor, which he did every time, he becomes way too tanky and we fall. So I'm off training again. I've been trying to sneak in speed and defense EVs where I could, with attack being a nice one to grab as well. Peppermint just feels like it needs a little bit of everything. Alright, I needed that quick little W, let's get back to Koga. As it turns out, level 50 was the ticket with Muck going for Minimize this time. Aerial Ace does not mind that and we're able to two hit his Ace wheezing in the back. I had a good feeling that even if we'd missed with Aurora Beam and switched to Aerial Ace after taking that smoke screen, we would have still been in decent shape. Silly Muck. Let's see if those extra levels help with Rival 5 at all. Great news, Aurora Beam is now a clean one-shot against Pidgeot. Bad news? Water Pulse only deals around half to Charizard as his flamethrower drops us from full health. Hmm, maybe it was some kind of fluke? Ha, nope, he one-shots us easily a second time. I firmly believe that everything happens for a reason. Recently, I've been becoming conscious of how fortunate I've been in my runs that I've never had anybody been super walled by Rival 5 with no other good options. I haven't needed to chase down a Pokemon to use Surf because I always just use the free Lapras. Thanks to the suggestion in a recent comment, I'm now heading up the back of Celadon Condominiums. At the top, I can snag a free EV off of the table because I was never taught boundaries. Also, this is a video game. Next, in the Celadon department store on the fourth floor, I can grab a Waterstone and evolve it to Vaporeon. This doesn't fully replace Lapras, I still need someone for strength. I'll simply replace Vaporeon with Lapras once we get it, gaining easy access to Cinnabar Island for now. Have I mentioned recently how much I love the evolutions in these games? Neither of our racers will be evolving today, and I hope you enjoyed watching EV evolve as much as I did. Unfortunately, access to Cinnabar doesn't do a ton for Peppermint, as our next gym leader is the Fire type. I've battled, like, one additional trainer, and I can only imagine what this upcoming battle is gonna look like for us. Oh, ignore that little trainer battle there, I was a little egg-sighted with the run button. I mean, B button. I'll leave you in suspense with this one, though, let's check back with Schnapps. I've finally taught Psychic, also managing to get the 30% chance to drop Pidgeot's special defense by one stage. This guarantees the two-shot, with Schnapps having an answer for his next few Pokémon. Alakazam sets up Reflect, ruining our Dizzy Punch potential, so I switch to Faint Attack. Against Blastoise is when things fall apart again, though. This battle ends up feeling fairly lucky, also getting a critical hit against Blastoise. Despite that, including the Future Sight from Alakazam hitting, we're brought down quickly by the Shellfish Pokémon. Including our luck in that attempt, that felt like a battle we should not be continuing to try. It's funny, you know. I was so worried about this Cinnabar access problem, then getting a comment with a perfect solution, literally days before I ended up needing it twice. If you put good out into the universe, the universe pays it back, my friends. It's pretty wild. Heh <laughs> they pour on evolution again. Moving on. An advantage to playing second is that you get the benefit of some egg experience. It's been a while since I ran Pokémon with base stat totals this low, and learning what I did from Peppermint's run, I felt like it was a solid choice to defeat every trainer in Blaine's gym. This has a benefit of giving us plenty of speed EVs as well, which I feel Schnapps wants. A lot of the time, it certainly feels like speed is control with a solo runner. Let's check out Blaine. Water Pulse is just barely not able to get the one-shot against Growlithe, tanking a heavy Fire Blast in return. Oh boy, I managed to bring down Growlithe and then against Ponyta, I switched to Dizzy Punch. I was already not feeling great about this one, so I was just experimenting. Okay, that's not gonna be happening right now. With that extra grinding though, let's go check out Rival 5 again. I'd say that we are not nearly as lucky in this one as we were last time. Pidgeot uses Feather Dance, removing the possibility of attacking with Dizzy Punts once we add in Growlithe's Intimidate to that as well. Even so, we make it back to the Big Bad Blastoise with 74 health and no Future Sight coming our way. Our luck returns a little bit, getting that special defense drop which I feel allowed us to win this battle. It's real close, but we are victorious. We're gonna continue following Schnapps for a moment, challenging Sabrina next. Just like trying to keep present on Peppermint, I wanted to keep as many moves that caused confusion on Schnapps as I could. Dizzy Punch is an objectively worse option at this moment, but I wanted to keep with the theme of this Pokémon. 
I considered doing this with Teeter Dance, but that physical coverage has been way too nice. Sabrina Falls gaining access to Calm Mind. Calm Mind boosts your special attack and special defense by one stage in battle. I'm gonna be teaching this to Schnapps right away, heading back to Cinnabar Island and Blaine. I'll play a proper intro this time. The best part about setting up with Calm Mind is that Growlithe's Fire Blasts are doing progressively less damage every turn. I guesstimated that I would need three Calm Minds for this battle, relying on super effective Water Pulse. I set up, taking out Growlithe. I'm hoping that this was an overkill, bringing down the rest of his team with a single shot each. Being able to set up changes this game entirely. With seven badges in hand, it's time for a choice. Upon exiting the gym, Bill will approach us asking us to help him again. This is not required for a normal completion of the game, but if you say yes here, you'll go to the Sevi Islands to start a new secondary plotline out there. Since I have a round two finish in mind, I find it's best to do this now, so while Schnapps goes off and does that, let's see how Peppermint is handling Fire Blast. Our super effective Water Pulse brings down Growlithe in one, that's great! It does not, however, do the same against Ponyta, and we take an absolutely massive Fire Blast, almost being one-shot. We keep pushing through the battle, but Rapidash is too much, ending Peppermint. After a couple of more wipes, I decided that this wasn't happening, heading back to Sylph to try Rival 5 once again. I decided to try Aerial Ace against Charizard this time, unfortunately, it looks like it's putting him at around a third health into Blaze range. This powers up his flamethrowers even more, but I don't really think that that matters here. We are not surviving regardless. It's time for more training, heading down Cycling Road for more attack EVs and defense EVs, clearing the entire route. I'll be doing a little bit of additional grinding on Route 15 as well, aiming for level 58 over the next damage rounding threshold. Peppermint really doesn't have that many options here, so we're down to leveling up. At least that fast growth rate is continuing to keep this grind easy. As it turns out, all we needed was a critical hit. This time Water Pulse one-shots Charizard using just that, and without being one-shot ourselves, we can then win the battle. I'm genuinely worried about all of this in the next playthrough, because at this point in the run I was thinking HP Rock would sure be nice. After a few battles in the later game, I'm not sure that that's gonna be an option. I defeated a single trainer in Sabrina's gym when an idea hit me. I should go back and see how Blaine goes again. If it's still awful, I'll make a point to defeat all of these trainers in this gym. So now at level 60, let's go back and see if that battle has improved in any significant way. The good news is that now Growlithe and Ponyta are one-shots. The bad news is that Rapidash isn't even close, with his Fire Blast dropping us to low red bar also getting a burn, and it's that damage that finishes the fight. There's still an Arcanine to deal with too. Time to go beat all of the trainers in Sabrina's gym. After defeating all of them, it's time for Sabrina herself. Her psychic types are quite physically frail with some stab, aerial ace, hustle action, leveling each one of them in one shot. Why couldn't Blaine be that easy? At least I had the foresight to grind in here first. Sabrina's gym does have a fair few special attack EVs which we're gonna want for our ice moves. It was while doing that little bit of additional grinding to get to level 63 that I realized something. I headed back to Fuchsia City and back onto Route 15 to the east. I circle past some trainers that I've already cleared, cutting the bush and heading back west to grab TM18 Rain Dance. Sorry Peppermint, I kept present as long as I possibly could. With Rain Dance on our side, we're looking much better. It not only boosts our Water Pulse's damage by one and a half times, but it also halves the incoming fire damage that we take. I set it up turn 1 against Growlithe, tanking a Fire Blast with ease, and one-shotting his Ponyta, then Rapidash bringing out the Ace Arcanine. We miss the one-shot against him, but in typical spin to fashion, we trigger the confusion and Arcanine hits himself, ending the battle. That was a great way for that to go down. I also help Bill in the Sevi Islands, and then it's time to face the final gym leader, Giovanni. <laughs> All of that additional training for Blaine sure makes Giovanni look like a total pushover. Unfortunately, I invested quite heavily into vitamins, so we don't have enough money for Ice Beam at this point, but Aurora Beam is still rocking enemies like it's going out of style. I did use Water Pulse against his Rhyhorns, but Aurora Beam would have done the same thing. I one-shot every member of his party, with Peppermint finishing the gym challenge in just over an hour and 21 minutes. 
While Peppermint needed a huge amount of additional training, Schnapps has been moving along fairly well. For comparison, Schnapps is 12 levels lower than Peppermint was at the end of this battle. As such, after taking out Rhyhorn with Water Pulse to guard us from Scary Face, I set up a single Calm Mind against Nidal Queen and proceed to sweep the rest of his team with Psychics and a little bit more Water Pulse. This coverage is great. Having this setup is great. I have high hopes for Schnapps. Schnapps has managed to widen his lead, now 18 minutes ahead at the end of the gym challenge. There's still a lot of game left to play, and Rival 6 stands between us and the leagues. Falling into our nature, I made a very rash decision here. I taught Shockwave over Faint Attack. I've just recently run Mewtwo, and this is the exact set that I used with it. The biggest difference, though, is that Schnapps is not a Mewtwo. Getting rid of Faint Attack was a big mistake, but we'll come back to that later. We can already see the effects of that mistake, though, revealing themselves 30 seconds later after replacing the move. I have no options against Execute, and he manages to paralyze me. The battle falls apart from there, with Alakazam finishing the job. In the next battle, I set up to four Calm Minds against Growlithe, as he felt like the least threatening of the lot. This grants us a much easier time against Alakazam, and also his Blastoise that follows. We can finish the battle, leveling up to 58. There are no further preparations to make before the League, so let's hop back to Peppermint and start heading in that direction as well. Peppermint still has a big old problem though, and that problem is named Charizard. 15 levels higher than him, and Water Pulse does not do half damage, while his stab super effective flamethrower once again burns away Peppermint. In the next battle, I set up Rain Dance against Pidgeot, only taking a little bit of damage. This puts Charizard into Blaze range when I hit him with Water Pulse, but it seems that his AI wants to lower our speed in the rain, thankfully missing Scary Face. After that little exchange played out, the rest of the battle was no problem at all for Peppermint. We finished the battle, leveling to 69, nice, and as it turns out, I might have gone a little hard on vitamins. We cannot afford Ice Beam at the moment. Whoops, let's jump into the Pokemon League. I have to admit that I'm actually incredibly impressed with Peppermint and Hustle in this battle. Aerial Ace is actually doing quite good damage, though we are quite overleveled. Against Cloyster, I should be going for Water Pulse, not Aurora Beam, as it's four times resisted. It's against Slowbro that we're finally overwhelmed, being taken out from about 40% by Surf. I hope you can forgive me skipping a whole bunch of time and resets. I've had an incredibly busy holiday season, but I'm determined to have this video ready for the end of the month. We've jumped ahead only three resets, but eight minutes as I left to go clear out all of the trainers in Victory Road. At level 74, we're trying again, but it's clear that we're still lacking just a little bit of damage output. We're making it further into the battle, but Lapras takes us down again. I've had enough grinding at this point, using four rare candies to bring us to level 78 over two damage rounding thresholds. In this battle, I, for the most part, am just spamming Aerial Ace and hoping at this point. I do have a Chesto Berry equipped for Yawn from Slowbro or Lovely Kiss from Jinx, but we end up outspeeding Jinx and Aerial Ace one-shots. Hustle has been so incredibly valuable for us, much more so than Vital Spirit, which would have prevented sleep. Lorelei finally falls, moving on to Brew No 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 next. Three things to mention here. We have four times super effective Water Pulse for his Onyxes, and Stab Aerial Lace Hustle Strats for his fighters. And third, we're roughly 25 levels higher than his team. I have nothing more to say. Let's not talk about Bruno. Agatha follows. <laughs> I'm just gonna have to continue gushing about how well Aerial Ace and Hustle are working together right now. We can delete her lead Gengar, but then Arbok is out intimidating us so our physical attacks are now dealing less damage. I go for Aerial Ace against Golbat, finishing with Aurora Beam, but I just should have gone for that first. As a result, we took one more turn of damage and her Ace Gengar ends the battle shortly after. She gets me once more, but as you can see, Aurora Beam is a much better choice against Golbat getting the one-shot. In my failed attempt, I learned to have a Chesto Berry, which is really something that I should know to do anyway by now. Aerial Ace isn't one-shotting, but it's still doing significant enough damage that we cruise through her remaining team, even with her constantly trying to put us back to sleep. The Dragon Master Lance is next. <laughs> Thank you. 
Aurora Beam would have been the correct choice multiple times that I neglect to figure out in this battle. I was just so in love with Aerial Ace and I used it against Gyarados despite the cut from Intimidate. I switched to Aurora Beam, taking him out but were quite beat up at only around a third health. At 177 speed, we outspeed Aerodactyl by 4, using Water Pulse for less damage than Stab Aurora Beam would do. Note to self, less vitamins, more Ice Beam. Aerodactyl cannot be allowed to hit us with Stab 4 times super effective Ancient Power overkilling Peppermint. He gets the best of me twice more, so I tied into my rare candies again, leveling to 83 over the next damage rounding threshold for Aerodactyl. It was a one-shot I just kept missing. This time Stab Aurora Beam handles Gyarados and one-shots Aerodactyl. It's then no surprise that the Ice type completely dominates Lance's Dragons offensively. It's just a darn shame how weak it feels defensively. The Elite Four has fallen, all that remains is the Round 1 Champion. We have super effective options against his first two Pokémon, getting rid of them right away with a couple of one-shots. Charizard is the big threat. I set up the rain, tanking a Fire Blast into Red Bar. Yeah, that damage was halved in the rain, remember. I didn't know if this mattered at the time, but we score a critical hit on the next turn, taking out Charizard. Aerial Ace starts doing its great work again, but against Gyarados, we're a ways off of the one-shot with Thrash subtracting our remaining health. Again, for the sake of brevity, I'm skipping ahead. That crit against Charizard mattered. It really mattered. We're now 5 minutes and 9 resets later, having used the last of my rare candies, now attempting the battle at level 87. I started setting up the rain turn 1 against Pidgeot, hoping to not take a sand attack. We don't here, taking out Rhydon next. I don't set up against him because of Scary Face. I cannot lose the speed. There are a couple of things that can go right here. Charizard can miss the 85% accurate Fire Blast, we could crit, or what happens here, Water Pulse can confuse him and he hits himself in confusion. Charizard falls on the next turn and from there the battle is looking pretty good. Gyarados can still drop a ton of pain onto us, but I have a Citrus Berry equipped to give us that little bit of additional buffer. Not long after that Charizard fell, the champion has been defeated. Well, that was fun, I guess. I'm a little worried about being out of Rare Candies and level 87 at the end of round 1 though. Round 2 is going to be significantly more difficult. Peppermint clocks in with a round 1 time of 1 hour, 47 minutes and 40 seconds at level 87 with 45 resets. This took 5 hours and 34 minutes of game time. Jumping back to the start of the league, let's see how Schnapps handles round 1. This first battle is very much a case of figuring it out. I set up two Calm Mines against Dugong, nope, that isn't enough. I set up one more, then take out the Sea Lion Pokémon. I then sneak in another Calm Mind against Cloyster as it loves to pretty much do nothing, but once we get to Lapras, we're still not doing enough damage with Body Slam taking us out. No worries though, Calm Mind reduces the damage we take every turn, so I set up all the way to plus 6, but we're super beat up in Red Bar. We can then rip through her Dugong, Cloyster, Slowbro, and Lapras leading us to Jinx in the back. This is another instance where I feel that Faint Attack would have been superior to Psychic as we miss the one shot getting put to sleep and Jinx takes us out once again. In the next battle, with the exact same amount of health, I also have a Chesto Berry equipped. Jinx uses Lovely Kiss again, with the berry waking up Schnapps and one final Water Pulse ending the battle. That's it for Lorelei, but Bruno might be the counter-argument for Psychic sticking around. I want to keep our speed intact. At 112, we're outsped only by Hitmonlee, and Bruno's fighting types are going to inflict a world of hurt against our little Spot Panda. I take out Onyx immediately, but then Hitmonchan hits a Rock Tomb, lowering our speed. Now slower, he combos us with a stab, super effective Sky Uppercut, ending the battle. Schnapps' turn to grind, 6 resets and just under 10 minutes later we're back at level 66 after clearing Victory Road. I get a lucky break against Hitmonchan with him missing the 80% accurate Rock Tomb. Psychic is still not nearly enough by itself, but I steal the opportunity to set up one Calm Mind while he heals. Psychic one-shots Hitmonchan and Hitmonlee as we now outspeed. Not Machamp though, as he hangs on in Red Bar and Crosschop takes us out from full. 
Well, alright then, I don't want to be here forever, so I used two rare candies leveling up to 68 over the next damage rounding threshold. Then after one more attempt, I get similar circumstances against Hip-on-Chan, but the difference this time is that our slightly higher damage output allows us to one-shot Machamp. His second Onyx is an easy cleanup after that, but oh boy, I am terrified of what round 2 Bruno is going to look like for both of these racers. Let's check out Agatha. Ah, uh, finally. A battle where I can say the following. I set up a single Calm Mind and proceed to sweep her team. Schnapps levels up to 69 after defeating Golbat. Nice. And we get a spot of trouble against her lead Gengar. She puts us to sleep and I'm buryless. She then inflicts a nightmare, but Schnapps is like, Huh? No way, man. I wasn't asleep, just resting my eyes. And proceeds to one-shot Gengar and haunt her in the back. Phew. Next is that guy with all the flying types. I debated what was best to do here for a moment. I decided to try knocking out Gyarados immediately to avoid Dragon Rages, but we missed the one shot. I set up one Calm Mind while he heals and take him out on the next turn. Aerodactyl way outspeeds us, and by some strange turn of events, I predict the heal incorrectly going for another Calm Mind while also being fine because he uses Hyper Beam and has to recharge for a turn. It doesn't really matter in the end as his Ace Dragonite's outrage is more than Schnapps could handle. I got crit with Hyper Beam for another reset, but in the next attempt I had an idea. I set up to plus 3 against Gyarados while he hits with Dragon Rages, but I now have a Citrus Berry that activates, giving us about 3 quarters of a Dragon Rage back in healing. When his Ace Dragonite hits the field, we crit with Psychic, and that absolutely mattered. I don't think we would have survived Hyper Beam, so I'm gonna have to come up with something a lot better here in the next run. Lance's Dragonairs both fall in short succession, finishing the Elite Four once again. It's champion time. In hindsight, I'm realizing that I tried playing Spinda too much like I played Mewtwo. I take out Pidgeot immediately with Shockwave, but it takes two shots. My idea was to avoid Sand Attack, which we do, and set up against Alakazam. But Alakazam hurt Schnapps a heck of a lot more than he hurt Mewtwo. Stab Psychics are just too much. These resets hurt because these resets are long. Seven resets later, taking six minutes of real time, and I've now dipped into our rare candies again, leveling up to 80. I grab a single turn of Calm Mind against Pidgeot, only risking one turn of Sand Attack. We take a Feather Dance, perfect. This is my second argument for keeping Faint Attack over Psychic. I've taught Rest over Psychic because I needed the recovery to be able to set up still. Even if I defeated Alakazam, I had nothing but resisted moves for Executor, and he would end me. I set up all the way to plus 6, resting as required before bringing down Alakazam. I was prepared to rest even more against Executor as his Giga Drains would be quite ineffective, and I just couldn't see us sleeping for more turns than it takes for Egg Bomb to bring us down. Surely. Arcanine sneaks in one extreme speed, leaving us at 69 health. Nice, but we end the battle shortly after. I feel like a bit of planning is all that a second playthrough is going to need for Spinda. Just a little bit of moveset planning. Oh boy, I hope so anyway. Schnapps clocks in with a round 1 time of 1 hour, 33 minutes and 39 seconds at level 80 with 32 resets. This took 4 hours and 49 minutes of game time. Priority number one for both of these two between the leagues is grabbing the leftovers and a few scattered rare candies that I left behind in the region. Something tells me that we're going to see at least one level 100 finish today. Additionally, I'm going to be revisiting Mount Moon with Schnapps after buying some Ultra Balls. I'm going to go catch a few Paris, and I hope it's quicker than teaching Thief. I want a couple of those tiny mushrooms. I then revisit Two Island with my mushrooms and swing by the Move Relearner to put Faint Attack back in our set. Unfortunately, I saw the best replacement being Shockwave as I wasn't ready to part with Rest. Beyond that, there isn't anything special to report, so let's jump straight into those round 2 battles. On top of some team and moveset changes, all teams have been powered up by around 12 levels. <laughs> Using Faint Attack this time, we've lost our super effective option against Lorelei. But that's okay. We can set all the way up to plus 6 with Calm Mind, all while Dugong continues to set up its evasiveness. Not a problem at all, as Faint Attack cannot miss. I start my Assault, switching to Water Pulse for Piloswine, but otherwise dealing big damage while taking very little in return from her team. Lorelei falls, but Bruno? Oh boy, Bruno. <laughs> Bruno. 
In this first battle, we managed to get some good luck. I didn't think that we could one-shot, going for one Calm Mind while Steelix misses his first Rock Tomb. I then missed the one-shot, but Steelix went for Earthquake, so our speed is good. Water Pulse then misses the one-shot against Hitmonchan, being smacked by a massive Sky Uppercut, followed by a Priority Mock Punch that ends the battle. Remember, I played Schnapp second, and by the end of this run, things were getting to me a little bit. At this point, I've closed the game, cheated in some rare candies, and leveled Schnapps all the way to level 100. How much of a difference has that made? Well, not a ton, honestly. We simply lack the damage output needed against his fighters to not get blown up by super effective damage. I could set up, but then our speed would get trashed, and those hits that we're trying to avoid would come once again. Now at level 100, we're ready to teach my favorite move, Substitute. Substitute sacrifices a quarter of your max HP to put a decoy with health equivalent to what was sacrificed. The decoy then blocks damage and, more importantly, status conditions from your opponents. Used in combination with leftovers, I can stall out Steelix's Rock Tombs, keeping my speed intact and going all the way to plus six. From there, I let Bru no 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 know that I've had enough of him. Plus six water pulses claim a series of one shots. I mean, we're in round two with base stat totals in the mid to low 300s. This felt inevitable. <laughs> Substitute blocks a lot of Agatha's shenanigans like Hypnosis and Confuse Ray as well. I'm very much learning this battle as I go again, but her lead Gengar loves setting up double teams and, once again, Faint Attack can't miss. I continue setting up more Calm Minds throughout the fight, grabbing two against Arbok because he also likes setting up double teams. That's enough to work through her remaining team members, so we're quickly moving on to the Dragon Doctoral Lance. <laughs> Against Lance in round two, Substitute with a setup move is pretty much a guaranteed win. His lead Gyarados will perpetually try to paralyze your decoy, allowing you to set up with impunity. I decided that plus four should be enough, then switching to offense and sweeping Lance's team. Aerodactyl outspeeds, breaking the decoy, and in hindsight, I'd likely set up to plus five instead, but this was a first try victory. What can I say, we're level 100 with substrats and Calm Mind. Let's see how we do against that round two champion. I reset once because of a bad move choice against Heracross, but more or less, the same strategy that we pivoted to with Substitute against Bruno works exactly the same here. You best believe that with the runs that I've been having, I'm setting all the way up to plus six again before going after him. That setup is just what the doctor ordered, as we're once again able to sweep through another team on the back of a decoy and a setup move. Sometimes I find it frustrating to fall into the same strategies, but you just can't argue with results. All right, well, if this is how things went with a setup move, I wonder how things are gonna go with Peppermint over there. Schnapps clocks in with a round two time of two hours and 48 seconds at level 100 after some cheats with 42 resets. This took six hours and nine minutes of game time. After clearing out the second part of the Sevi Island plotline, unlocking round two, the only additional chore Peppermint has is to finally grab Ice Beam. We're at level 90 right now with a couple of extra rare candies that I picked up along the way. Hopefully, all of that, plus the sustainability offered by Leftovers, allows us what we need to be successful in the upcoming league. From a race perspective, though, being two minutes away from Schnapses' completion time, things don't look great here for Peppermint. Lorelei, as always, leads the challenge. I have to say that I'm continuing to be impressed by Aerial Ace again. We take out Dugong handily, but then against Piloswine, there's a bit of a problem. His four times super effective Rock Slide hurts a whole bunch, bringing Peppermint all the way down to 11 HP. Ow. Lapras then ends the battle shortly after. After more resets, I left the league going to do a little bit of grinding on Seven Island. I still had patience left in me at this point, so I was fine going to do a touch of grinding. I'm heavily considering going back to always using perfect IVs in my runs. I really don't like cheating in rare candies in pretty much every run. We start the battle at level 95, and I tag Dugong with an Aerial Ace first, forcing her to heal on the first turn. I use that turn to set up the rain, going for the knockout next. The rain and those few additional levels guarantee the one shot against Piloswine. At full health and at level 95, we have good enough options to work through her remaining Pokemon. 
That's the first league member down. You would assume that Bruno is completely awful given how many rock slides he now has on his team. But honestly, our win condition is fairly simple. All I need is for Steelix to miss a rock tomb, a 1 in 5 chance. With one turn of Calm Mind, the Water Pulse one-shot Steelix with Stab super effective Aerial Ace handling his fighters again. Was that miss absolutely necessary? Yes. Observe the damage we take from a single Iron Tail from his second Steelix. That is a big ouchie. With the rain back up, though, Steelix 2 falls. Phew. All right, Agatha, your turn. Our Aerial Aces are struggling just a touch in this battle. We're consistently missing one-shots, leading to an unnecessary risk against her earlier Pokémon, then a massive Thunderbolt that we barely survived from her lead Gengar. After missing the one-shot against Arbok as well, this battle is over. In the next attempt, we face a nearly identical situation, but this time the RNG plays out just slightly differently. We end up with slightly more health against Arbok surviving Sludge Bomb this time, but she gets a poison. Thank goodness for leftovers, as we heal and the poison damage ticks, we're left at 4 hit points. Ice Beam finishes the battle on the next turn, but that was way too close. Alright, Ice Type, Dragon Trainer, should be easy, right? Well, first I'll show the battle allowing myself to be paralyzed by his lead Gyarados. It goes, as expected, not so great. His lead Gyarados hurts a whole bunch with Hyper Beam, with then his only second Pokémon finishing the job, outspeeding because we're paralyzed. With a Cherry Berry though, we absolutely tear his team apart. At 214 speed, we're 6 points above Aerodactyl, whose ancient power I'm not sure we would have survived. Ice Beam makes short work of Lance's dragons though, leaving once again one final challenge to overcome, the Round 2 Champion. I'm skipping ahead right off the bat this time. Suddenly, we have 8 more resets on the board and we're level 100. Yep, unfortunately, I've now cheated with Peppermint as well, maxing our level with Rare Candies. How much has level 100 impacted this battle for us? Well, take a look. I can't risk taking one hit from Heracross, so I take him out immediately. Water Pulse does around half to Charizard, and we get one shot by Fire Blast. I was getting a little loopy near the end here, so just for context, this was the mentality that I started Schnapps' run with. It was time to start using Double Team. Ugh, yuck. Oh, in case you didn't believe me, check out what Heracross does to us with a 50 base power Rock Tomb. Nearly 80% of our health, plus a speed drop. Nope, nope, nope. So while I went through the absolute ringer with this battle, thanks to the magic of editing, you don't have to. Just know that all you're missing is a long series of progressively less appropriate egg splitives. 18 resets later, thankfully being just over 5 minutes and we see a successful attempt. I am 100% relying solely on luck to get through at this point. I managed to get my plus 6 double team set up against Heracross, taking him down. I cannot express how frustrated I was with this Charizard. Plus 6 with double team, when we would even get to this point, and he hit through with the 85% accurate Fire Blast almost every time. There's another problem after that though, but first enjoy this critical ice beam making Charizard go away. I sure am. Tyranitar wrecked my day more times than I'm willing to admit as well. I was none too pleased with this champion battle at this point. After the Gen 2 pseudo falls, it's pretty smooth sailing though. We even get a freeze against his Gyarados for a little icing on top. Finally, I can put these first playthroughs behind me. I captured these first runs before the first leg of my holiday adventures, and now editing it, I can see just how tired I was. I can also feel just how tired I am. But I am so determined to finish this year strong. Peppermint clocks in with a round 2 time of 2 hours, 21 minutes, and 58 seconds at level 100 with 77 resets. This took 6 hours and 59 minutes of game time. In the second playthroughs, I'll only be showing things that differed from the first runs or that I found interesting while playing. These two actually followed slightly different routes to Brock, but only slightly. Both will be using the same natures and choice of egg moves with Aurora Beam being so incredibly valuable for the majority of last run. I make for a great start against the rival in the lab, but hey, we're up and moving. 
Delibird clears the entirety of Viridian Forest on the way through, heading to Pewter Gym after a quick restoration of RPP. Inside of the gym, I defeat Camper Liam super easily with Aurora Beam leveling to 13 and then one-shotting both of Brock's Pokémon. Then in Mount Moon, I make sure to grab the Helix Fossil. I made sure to defeat an extra trainer or two along the way, aiming to defeat one more in Misty's Gym to level to 20. At level 20, I one-shot Pidgeotto with Aurora Beam and our Hustle strats remain, hitting through with Mega Kick and deleting Charmander. This kind of dominance will be the same for every rival battle until level 5 and Sylph Co. I'll be skipping Secret Power this time, battling Misty next. In Mount Moon, I made sure to dip down and grab Thief specifically to make Misty more consistent. If Mega Kick lands on Starmie, then I can switch to the super effective Thief and 100% accuracy to finish the battle. I then defeat Rival 3 on the SSN, but I'll be skipping Lieutenant Surge again. We'll need a few more levels for him, going to the mid-game next. For the most part, these routes remained exactly the same, only with better and earlier grinding. Aerial Ace is core to Delibird's strategy once again, and I've also made sure to grab an army of Meowths this time, pursuing hidden power. I then quickly defeat the Rockets in the hideout, heading to Erica's gym next. On the way, I'm grabbing the coin case again, but this time I'm going to be able to afford Ice Beam much earlier. Another advantage of the Meowths is that they'll sometimes find things like Nuggets, so we should be swimming in cash after our grind. I then defeat Erica and Lieutenant Surge, following the same route as last time. Then I defeat Rival 4 in Pokemon Tower, and it's off to Sylphco for item collection. I'll be doing a full clear again, doing a little bit of training along the way. After buying the vitamins, it's time to shoot down Cycling Road. We'll be back training here in just a second. In fact, Delibird is going to be clearing the vast majority of the game from Celadon until the Pokémon League. For Delibird's second run, all I could figure out was that this was a race to level 100. After about 10 minutes of straight grinding and grabbing Rain Dance again, we're ready to move on. We can stomp Koga Flat at level 55, then heading back to Sylph after a touch more training. We also had enough money to buy Ice Beam, so we're looking very solid at Rival 5. Level 58 gives us a chance to one-shot Charizard in the rain here, which we get in this battle. Things are feeling quite good for Delibird, considering we were only two minutes ahead of our last run at Koga, but eight levels higher. Now it's time for some big time saves for Delibird. I defeat Sabrina, and then go after Blaine after defeating all of the trainers in his gym as well. We're relying on the same strategy as last time, Rain Dance into Water Pulses. We miss the one shot against his Ace Arcanine, but in the rain we survive his Fire Blast with room to spare. A bit of planning sure does help. I then quickly defeat Giovanni, finishing the gym challenge just under 14 minutes faster than last run. Rival 6 then falls, using the same Rain Dance strategy as Rival 5, and Delibird is almost ready to face the league again. I will be clearing the entirety of Victory Road as well, leaning into that fast growth rate for any advantage that I can gain. That's it for Delibird's changes, let's jump back and check out Spinda's before getting into these leagues. Most things remain the same for Spinda as well until the later game. We'll be defeating the same number of trainers, only Spinda will be diverting west to face rival 1.5 instead of Camper Liam. These battles get us to level 12, ready to face Brock. Faint Attack does great again, finishing him easily. Then in Mount Moon, I make sure to grab the Dome Fossil. I was more conservative with extra trainers too, only leveling to 18. Rockslide makes Rival 2 much easier, finishing the next route and defeating Misty soon after. Spinda will be grabbing an army of Meowths as well, as I felt that Hidden Power would be a great asset to both runners. Can you guess what I went with? Let me know in the comments. I then defeat Rival 3 on the SSN, and Lieutenant Surge for our third badge. After the mid-game chores, I dip west to Saffron again to collect TM29 Psychic. I'm not going to teach it until right before Erica, using the last of my Psybeam PP in her gym. I do just that, taking her down for our fourth badge. I know I'm skipping a lot here, but this is all almost identical to the last run so far. I then defeat Rival 4 in Pokémon Tower, and after a quick collection of items in Sylph, it's time to buy those vitamins. Just like last time, Calcium and Carbos. It's not that I didn't have a good idea of how to play these two last time, it's just that I had no idea what level thresholds I needed. Let's keep moving. Spinda has been doing a bit of additional training as well, and when we're facing Koga, we managed to one-shot his ace wheezing this time with Psychic. Spinda will be doing a fair amount of grinding too, but it will end up being less than Delibird by the end of the day. Koga falls and we face the same crossroad as last time. 
This time though, I head for Rival 5 instead of Cinnabar. I've made sure to put Return onto our moveset once we got access to it, and Return has been great. I use it against Bird Brains for some pretty impressive damage to be honest. I have a Citrus Berry equipped for that little bit of extra safety, but we have some pretty decent damage output to be honest in this battle. Rival 5 falls and our path to the end game becomes clear. The power of Return continues to do work against Sabrina, but this is the last time. She gives us Calm Mind and we're all special from here. Blaine falls to plus three water pulses, and Giovanni shortly after completing the gym challenge in under one hour. Spinda had nearly an 11 minute time save over the first playthrough at Sabrina, but lost a fair amount of time grinding, finishing the gym challenge at six and a half minutes faster than last time. Rival 6 falls just as easily, and we are ready for the round one leagues. It felt weird cutting out so much footage, but really the majority of the changes made were doing the same amount of grinding, only earlier. I'm going to be cutting even more footage here from these Round 1 leagues as we're going to be seeing much more impactful versions of the same battles in Round 2. For Spinda, I used 7 rare candies, leveling to 75 before Lorelei. She needed a Chesto Berry, with Agatha requiring another. Just before Lance, I used one of the three copies of Hidden Power that I found while I grinded to teach Hidden Power Ice. This makes the Lance threat almost disappear, and we're ready to challenge the Round 1 Champion. Keeping Faint Attack this time has had a myriad of benefits, but easily the most fun one is that I'm just gonna park myself here in front of Pidgeot, tanking as many Sand Attacks and Feather Dances as he wants to throw my way. No worries, man. The plan was to tank as many as possible in the hopes of getting to plus 6 to be able to one-shot Blastoise. I'm one ahead of myself, only setting up to plus 5, but because Faint Attack can't miss, our setup allows us to just roll through his team without much consideration at all. At plus 5, I miss the one-shot against Blastoise, but eh, we've got this one. What a difference having Faint Attack made. Is it a wonder why I went to get those mushrooms in the first playthrough? Spinda clocks in with a round one time of 1 hour, 8 minutes, and 40 seconds at level 78 with zero resets. This took 4 hours and 21 minutes of game time. So close! Jumping back, let's see how Delibird handles the first league. It's the same story, supercutting this earlier league as round two is going to be much more exciting. Delibird has done much more grinding overall so far, also using seven rare candies to be at level 80 as opposed to Spinda's 75. Delibird will be rocking with HP, well, rock. Our berry setup is also the same, a Chesto for Lorelei and for Agatha. Bruno was free, and Ice Beam made Lance free. We're feeling good this time, let's check out that round one champion. The reason that I decided to go for HP Rock was that so much of the leagues with Delibird felt like just seeking favorable outcomes, so why not put that power back in my hands? With Hustle, sure we have a 1 in 5 chance of missing every time, but hey, that's a fast way to reset compared to some of the others. 4 times super effective HP Rock deletes his main threat Charizard, and beyond that, Delibird feels pretty good in this battle. You can see our fragility though, as Gyarados crits with Hydro Pump, taking us to a quarter. I had a Citrus Berry on for safety, but that's the battle. With both competitors, I recognized that I needed to do a lot of grinding. Spinda is done with it, while poor Delibird here has some more to do between the leagues. Delibird clocks in with a round one time of 1 hour, 19 minutes and 40 seconds at level 83 with zero resets. This took 5 hours and 3 minutes of game time. Between leagues, the only thing to mention is that Delibird is back to grinding again. It's unfortunate, but I didn't find that most of the battles in round 2 were consistent until hitting level 100. I didn't need to use substitute or double team for Delibird, but I did need those levels. My favorite post-game grinding spot is Seven Island with the Versus Seeker. There's a free heal at the house, and these two cool trainers offer a lot of bang for your buck with experience. I have six rare candies left, so after grinding to level 94, I use them and we are ready to jump in. Part of my strategy here was to egg spec reset, so I go for the risky parts as early as I can. The biggest problem with Lorelei is taking too much damage, and using HP Rock to take out Dugong immediately makes a lot of difference. From there, I switch to Ice Beam, bringing down Piloswine in a single shot. That's a super close one shot too, even at this level. For the consistency, I continue hacking away at the rest of her team with Aerial Ace instead of HP Rock. Lorelei ends up being quite manageable, so let's check out Bruno. Thank you. 
I made sure to get right around 100 EVs in Special Attack as it makes for both of Bruno's Steelixes being one-shots with Ice Beam at level 100. Again, yes, level 100, or at least I think 98 or something was necessary for a favorable range here. Beyond them, Aerial Ace is way more than his fighters can handle. Substrats just don't work for Deli Bird. We took way too much damage from the Rock Tomb with our four times weakness to Rock. Bruno is a series of one-shots with Agatha waiting in the wings. Agatha is another battle where all I can say is that we're level 100 and we simply overpower her. Even so, her Ace Gengar manages to get in a super effective Thunderbolt and I feel like that really demonstrates just how frail we are still. We're 30 levels higher for goodness sake. Thunderbolt did around two thirds to us. Delibird's run really feels like one of the first ones where I didn't have much choice outside of luck or leveling up past our problems. Agatha falls and our ice typing should make short work of Lance. Oh, does it ever. Ice Beam won't shot his lead Gyarados, so I have a Cherry Berry equipped for when he paralyzes me. But we get lucky in this battle, freezing Gyarados and taking him out on the next turn. Why can't that ever happen when I need it to? Ice Beam absolutely rips through Lance's team, one-shotting everything else. At 232 speed, we well outspeed Aerodactyl and two-shot Kingdra in the back. I hate to say that that was easy because, well, level 100, but you know, it was. Last is the champion. This battle as well was very much a matter of luck out early or fail. It seems that Delibird's entire run against the rival's team revolved around taking out his lead and then ace with minimal fuss. Heracross is deleted by 4 times super effective stab Aerial Ace, then hitting the 80% accuracy Hustle Power Rock for the knockout against Charizard. This is the crazy part. Our success in the next part relies entirely on how much damage Tyranitar does to us. Yes, if his Thunderbolt hits us at the high end of his damage range, at the end of the battle, Gyarados will see a kill with Hyper Beam after a single Dragon Dance. 1DD makes him outspeed us, by the way. I know this. It isn't the case in this battle, though, with him going for Hydro Pump instead, and we take the victory. You know, for a base 330 Pokémon, I quite enjoyed playing Delibird. Not much for options, but those options work nicely for us throughout the game. Delibird clocks in with a round 2 time of 1 hour, 43 minutes and 8 seconds at level 100 with zero resets. A perfect run. This took 6 hours and 31 minutes of game time. Spinda, on the other hand, does no grinding in between leagues. Instead, we head back to Fuchsia City to pick up good old Substitute. It may not have worked for Delibird, but for Spinda? Oh yeah. Why would I grind to level 100 when I can get decoyed up instead? It was a tough thing for me, replacing Psychic, but it's for the best. Let's jump into things. Against Lorelei, I'm gonna be trying to set up all the way to plus 6 against her lead Dugong. Dugongong loves going for double teams, thank you once again to Faint Attack. Before jumping into the battle, I used the last of Spinda's rare candies, leveling up to 90 before the battle. We get our setup against Dugong and then sweep through her team with a series of one-shots. Lorelei was not Spinda's biggest problem though. Bruno was significantly more difficult, but with the grinding that I did earlier, I focused a lot on defense EVs. Cycling Road has a ton of coughings and wheezings that give defense EVs so our decoy can stand up to a few rock tombs before breaking. This allows us all of the time that I need to set up, all the way to plus 6 again. Excessive, you may be thinking? Not at all. At plus 5, we don't one-shot Machamp. We're playing a spin to everyone, cut me some slack here. Our investment into our speed makes us faster than Agatha's lead Gengar by a margin, setting up a decoy and avoiding hypnosis right away. This was an easier one, only needing to set up to plus two for faint attack to do its good work. Ice Beam handles Crobat, who we also outspeed, and after Arbok heals, we take it out as well. More faint attacks bring down more ghosts, and that's a third league victory. For how uncoordinated spin to seems, we seem to be moving with purpose right now. HP Ice is great against Lance as well, only requiring us to set up to plus 3 against his lead Gyarados. Just like last run with Spinda though, being able to drop a decoy in front of this Gyarados means that we can just set up for free. I wanna be consequence free. I wanna be where paralysis doesn't matter. 
Ah, it's been way too long since I've sung in my videos. I'm looking forward to sleeping for a week soon. With Lance falling, so do the Elite Four, leaving only the Round 2 champion to conquer. Not to sound like a broken record or anything, but Substitute saves this battle as well. I hide behind decoys and leftovers, slowly setting up to plus 6 once again and going for my sweep. In this battle, going to plus 6 is a luxury. We still don't one-shot everything, and most of our ability to set up depends on how Heracross feels. Spinda is sturdy enough, at level 93 that is, to be able to stall for quite a while here. Once we have our plus 6, we can then smash through the battle without much resistance at all. I've said it before, I'll say it again. Substrats, best strats, and you know that I had to have the last league of 2023 using them. Spin the clocks in with a round 2 time of 1 hour, 26 minutes, and 47 seconds at level 93 with 0 resets. A second perfect run? This took 5 hours and 30 minutes of game time. Let's quickly compare each runner before seeing how they compare to each other. Delibird started saving time right away, losing some of that gain around Surge because of some slightly different routing. We do a ton of additional grinding in the next section, still saving nearly 14 minutes by Sabrina and holding that for the rest of the gym challenge. This culminates in a time save of 28 minutes in round 1, with a total time save of 38 minutes and 50 seconds at the end of round 2 at the same level with 77 resets. I love how we got a perfect run here. Spinda also started saving time right away, revealing just how nice it is to come at the game with a plan. Spinda stays mostly consistent, gaining nearly 11 minutes by Sabrina as well, losing big chunks of that to the substantial grinding that was required. It all pays off though, saving 25 minutes in round 1, with 31 minutes and 2 seconds saved at round 2, 7 levels lower with 42 less resets. I'm kind of floored that I didn't end up getting a single reset with either run. Maybe I played a little bit too conservatively. Comparing the two, with the exception of the Brock split, Spinda carried this race for the entire time. Delibird was plenty strong enough, but Spinda simply felt more solid and had better options to deal with most of the game. I cannot understate how much I loved using Aerial Ace and Hustle though, what a fun combination. Well done to both of our runners, and with both being zero reset runs, I'd say that this is the perfect end to an exceptional 2023. On the tier list, this places Spinda between Dragonite and Crawdont, 4 seconds slower than Dragonite and 9 seconds faster than Crawdont. My versus videos definitely seem to form a cluster around that time. I have so much to redesign. Delibird, on the other hand, ends up hanging out just behind Politoed. I want to extend a special thank you to those of you generous enough to support the channel financially. You keep me motivated to continue to produce the best possible content that I can for everyone out there. From the bottom of my shell, thank you so much. And that's a wrap, everyone. To be honest, I don't have much of an outro for you today. 2023 has been amazing, and I am exhausted. If you feel like I've earned it, be sure to leave a like and comment about the run, what you'd like to see in the future, or just to say hi. Happy holidays! It's time for me to kick up my feet for a few days and enjoy some well-earned rest. There will not be a stream for this coming Tuesday, but the regularly scheduled exceptional programming will resume on Friday, January 5th. Until then, I hope everyone has a safe and enjoyable New Year's. I can't wait to see you all in the next year. Until then, take care everyone.